So, Judges chapter 4, uh, we're in a series called Lacking No Thing. And uh, I certainly don't lack the boldness to say what you're all are thinking. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, I want to talk today about maybe a woman you may or may not have known about. I'm going to teach for a moment. And I think there's some important lessons that we can learn from this, especially in the season that we are in as a church. Because in the back of my mind at the moment, I want to shift gears away from JL and I want to talk to you really deeply about the moves of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. But before we can do that, I want to talk to you about the reason um, that we uh, as individuals should operate in those because we lack no thing. And the purpose of those gifts that operate in our lives. And many people think that the church is lacking something. But Paul would write to the church in Corinth and he said, I'm thrilled for the amount of gifts that are operating in your church. You're being overwhelmed and overloaded with the gifts. And they're there not just for the betterment of the individual who uses that gift, but they are there for the betterment of the entire body of Christ. That's what the word manifest means if you're reading it in the scripture. So let me read in Judges chapter 4. Uh, you got to go back. We, Pastor Michael preached last week about David when he did get to preach. Uh, two weeks before that, we talked about a man by the name of Ehud who was left-handed, who did a cross draw. And today, we're going to talk about a woman and a nail. And if you see the progression that is happening here, we have a guy who draws cross-handed. And now the next victory is brought by a nail. It wasn't enough for Jesus to carry a cross. He then had to be nailed to the cross. So, now Deborah uh, was a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, was a judging Israel at this time. This is verse 4 of Judges chapter 4. And she would sit under the palm tree of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the mountains of Ephraim. And the children of Israel would come up to her for judgment. Then she sent and called for Barak, the son of Abinam, and from Kadesh and Naphtali, and said to him, Has not the Lord God of Israel commanded, Go and deploy troops at Mount Tabor. Take with you 10,000 men of the sons of Naphtali and of the sons of Zebulon. And against you I will deploy Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his multitude at the river Kishon. And I will deliver him into your hand. Let me just give you a little history of what's happening here before we get later on to the same chapter of this book. There was a confederation of Canaanite nations that was ruled by a king by the name of Jabin. It was, and he was uh, ruling from a little town called Hazar, which was 15 miles to the north of what we would call the Sea of Galilee. And this king had great power. Matter of fact, in verse 3, it lists out his power. It says there that Jabin had 900 chariots of iron. And for 20 years, he harshly oppressed the children of Israel. And so the Bible begins to list out the armament of this king that is over the top of them for 20 years. He seems that he is completely invincible. He has 900 chariots of iron. An invincible army. And God raises up a woman by the name of Deborah. And Deborah is now judging Israel. She has taken the place that should have been filled by a man. But because no man would rise to the occasion, they were steeped in fear. A woman instead rises up to the challenge and she steps in and does the job that the men were supposed to do. What an indictment of a civilization that the men would cower in fear while the women rise up in bravery. What an indictment of God's house where women are in all the leadership positions because we can't find men qualified to do it. Thankfully, at SIWC, we don't really have that problem. But I've grown up in church where people would slam the women and then they would quote verses out of the New Testament about how women were supposed to remain silent in the church. Well, if the women had remained silent in the church, we would have had a dead church. Because the men weren't saying anything either. So God found this woman and he used this woman mightily. This woman named Deborah. And he uses it as an indictment against the men of Israel. Saying if the men won't lead then we'll bring the women up and the women will lead. 
And so Deborah then summons this man by the name of Barak. And he said to her, and, and so they're having this conversation. And then Barak, in verse 8, says to her, If you will go with me, then I will go. But if you will not go with me, I will not go. If you don't go to battle with me, Deborah, we're not going to have a battle. I'm so terrified that all of my courage is going to come from you, Deborah. I have been there. There have been days where I did not want to walk to the pulpit and I told Melissa, I need you on the front row with me. Because the battle that I'm fighting seems invincible. And there are times where you're going to need a partner because one can put a thousand, but two can put ten thousand. And as Pastor Pete would tell me, by the time you take that law of arithmetic to 12, the 12 had more authority and power than all of the angels who fell out of heaven. So he said, I I'm not going to go unless you go. So she says back to him, I will surely go with you. Nevertheless, there will be no glory for you in the journey that you are taking. For the Lord will sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. Then a Deborah arose and went with Barak to Kadesh. Now this is a prophecy. Deborah prophesies. I love that because I get one of the biggest things I get hammered on outside of the gift of the Holy Spirit in this church is that we utilize women in ministry. This woman prophesies. And not only does she prophesy, the prophecy comes true. And I can prove that to you in the New Testament too. God still uses women. So the prophecy didn't come to pass. Barak would not be given credit for Sisera's demise. Instead, that honor would go to a woman. Now, automatically, we're thinking that that honor is going to go to Deborah. So in verse 10, Barak calls Zebulon and Naphtali. He calls them to Kadesh. And he went up with them, 10,000 men under his command. And Deborah went up with him. So he's calling two tribes in the region to join with him in the fight. Verse 11, now Heber the Kenite of the children of Hobab, who is the father-in-law of Moses, had separated himself from the Kenites and pitched his tent near the terebinth tree as Anam, which is beside Kadesh. So Heber means to cross over, just as the word Hebrew means crossing over. So the Kenites lived in Israel, but they were not Israelites. They were descendants of Moses, his father-in-law, his name was Hobab, and you can find that in Numbers chapter 10 and verse 29. They had settled in Israel, but they were allied with the king Jabin. So they were actually the enemies, this little, this little tribe, it was actually allying with the enemy of Israel. And so they're now in this alliance, so they're not at war with Jabin, but the Israelites are now at war with this king by the name of Jabin. And in verse 12, then this little tribe who was in alliance with Jabin, they reported, in verse 12, they reported to Sisera that Barak, the son of Abinoam, had gone up to Mount Tabor. So my question would be is, why is he alerting the enemy of God's people that God's people are getting ready to go out to battle? And I would tell you, I think he was setting them up for defeat. I think oftentimes we don't understand that when we get ready for spiritual victory, that our enemy is already prepared for us to fight. Like we often want to launch a surprise attack against the devil in our lives. Can I tell you, the devil already knows you're coming. Because it's been commanded by God that you and I would storm the gates of hell. But then it also says that the gates of hell shall not prevail against you. So he knows you're coming, so he's going to launch out, and he's going to remind you, just as this text does, it says it twice, that the amount of armament that the enemy had. He had 900 chariots of iron, so it says it twice. So there's something here, he wants to show a force that you should not even mess with. So when you go out to battle, the enemy arrays all of his power, all of his authority to convince you that you cannot win. So that you won't even attempt to fight because he knows that if you actually do fight, you're going to win. Why? Because the gates of hell shall not prevail against you. So his whole duty is to give this mirage, to give this idea in your mind that you will never be victorious. There is no point in ever fighting. I have 900 chariots of iron. You may have 10,000 members in your army, but I have greater weapons than you have. I have more power than you have. Don't even 
to come out here to the battlefield. And there are so many Christians who do not even enter into the battle because the enemy has you convinced that you are already defeated when in fact you are already victorious. Verse 14, so Deborah said to Barak, get up. Don't worry about them 900 chariots. Up, for this is the day which the Lord has delivered Sisera into your hand. Has not the Lord gone out before you? That's a good question, right? Has not the Lord gone out before you? Oh, I'm, I'm going to be sick and this sickness is unto death. Has not Jesus already had the stripes applied to his back? Has not the Lord already gone out before you? This is your day to seize what Jesus Christ has already won for you. Has not the Lord already gone out? So Barak went down from Mount Tabor with his 10,000 men following him. And the Lord, I love that, even though Barak was heading down with 10,000 men, the Lord routed Sisera and all his chariots and all his army with the edge of the sword before Barak. And Sisera alighted from his chariot and he fled away on foot. Now let me just give you a little background of this little verse here. Mount Tabor is a hill that sits in the middle of a valley called Jezreel. You probably don't know that valley as Jezreel. Some of you may know it as the valley of Jehoshaphat. More of you probably know it as the valley of Armageddon. This is a past battle that is telling us what is going to happen in the future. Where there is going to be an alliance, a confederacy of many nations that will rise up against God's people. But the Lord will deal with them right there in that valley. And what God has done, God will do again. You don't have to post on Facebook that you're on Israel's side. The Lord is on Israel's side. The Lord is on for his people's side. And he will take care of his people. And so I would say the same to you. You may be in the valley of your life. And that's where the enemy loves to attack you is right in the valley of your life. But can I tell you that for every valley of your life, the victory was already won at a mountaintop experience called Calvary where Jesus Christ already defeated your enemy. And so you can stand in your valley saying this is the day that the Lord has made and I will rejoice and I will be glad in it because even though I'm in the valley of my life, I am victorious because of Christ. And the Lord routed Sisera, all of his chariots and all of his army with the edge of the sword. And then Sisera alighted, got off of his chariot and fled away on foot. The Lord routed them all. And what I find hilarious is that the enemy who came out is so confidently in his chariots. When the time came for him to run away. He left the thing that he was so confident in and took off on his foot. Wouldn't it be amazing if we had such a victory in southern Illinois that the enemy who has launched out all of his opioids and all of his addictions and all of his chariots of iron and telling the church not to walk into the valley and fight. Wouldn't it be amazing that all of his confidence and everything that he's put out before us in this region, that we won such a victory by the sword of the Lord that the enemy who had so much confidence in methamphetamines, had so much confidence in crystal meth, had so much confidence in cocaine, had so much confidence in alcohol, had so much confidence in marijuana that they're now legalizing it. He has so much confidence that the church rises up and we send the enemy out of the camp and he has to leave what he was so confident in for us to destroy so it can never be used again. The one who had trusted in his horses and his chariots is now running away on foot. Psalm chapter 20 verses 6 through 9. Now I know that the Lord saves his anointed. He will answer him from his holy heaven and with the saving strength of his right hand. And some trust in chariots and some in horses. But we will remember the name of the Lord our God. 
they have bowed down and fallen, but we have risen and stand upright. Save, Lord, and may the King answer us when we call. My question to you is, is your faith in the news media and the politicians? Or is your faith in the chariots and the horses of this world? Or are you still one that says, as for me and my house, we still call and still stand for and still believe in the name of our Lord, who is Jesus Christ in our lives. So Sisera leaves, he flees, he's running, so confident. Now he's on the run. He flees away on foot and he runs to a tent where the woman by the name of Jael is there. Jael, who is the wife of Heber the Kenite. For there was peace. He runs to this tent because there was peace between Jabin the king of Hazar and the house of Heber the Kenite. So because there was peace between them, he thought that for sure, when he went into the tent of Jael, he would find refuge. He would find a place to hide until the storm had passed over. So that he could hide out long enough that the army of the Lord would pass by. Then he could sneak back out of that tent, go and redevelop another way to attack God's people. And I tell you that the church has done this for so long. We have won a victory, but we have not finished it. We have won a victory, but then we have not finished it. Only to allow the enemy a place of refuge somewhere on the sidelines with someone who has declared peace between them. And just allowing him the opportunity then to come back out of the tent and attack us yet again. And over and over again. How about we be the generation that puts our foot on the enemy's neck and we never let it up. We never let him get back out of the tent to declare war on another generation. How about this be the generation that doesn't tolerate and celebrate sin? How about this be the generation that doesn't tolerate it, but yet we celebrate the grace and the mercy and the power of Almighty God? How about we be the generation that doesn't tolerate dead, dry, boring church services or church as usual or the ritualistic movement? of God. How about we just let the Holy Spirit have its way in every aspect of our lives and let it keep flowing and moving and flowing and moving. Not just for a Sunday, not for a few weeks. Oh, we were in revival for a year but for our entire lifetimes that this be a refuge from despair for the world to run to and find the fountain of Almighty God in their lives. And I like old jail. She said, she went out to meet him. She went out to meet him. Come on in here. Turn aside, my Lord. That's a small L. Turn aside, my Lord. Turn aside. Do not fear. Don't, don't worry about it. Just come on in here. And when he had turned aside with her into the tent, she covered him with a blanket. She covers him with a blanket. Then he asked for some water. She says, I'm not going to give you water. I've got a whole gallon of 2% milk raised on our farm. Here you go. That milk will soothe those nerves, calm you right down. Let me cover you with a blanket here, drink a nice glass of warm milk and sleep tight. Don't worry about the nail bite. Just sleep tight. See, you remember the prophecy would come and the victory would come at the hand of a woman. And most of us think the woman was going to be Deborah because she was in leadership. And most often the greatest victories don't come from the leadership. It comes from the unknown woman in a sidebar tent that the enemy has rushed out away from the leadership thinking he was going to find refuge from despair in the member of the church in the back row. And he could just hide out in your tent. Or those of you that are at home online, he'd think he'd just hide out your house. And then 
the unknown folks, the folks that live in, over in Johnston City that nobody even cares about. You know, we all talk about Heron and Mary and Carver, you know, you know, West Frankfurt or, or DeCoin or, you know, some little sidebar, little town somewhere. Then everything, he can find some refuge. And, and he walks up and says, oh, I, I declared war at the church at SIWC, and I thought I could just follow you home, and if I just followed you home, I'd find some peace at your house. But I know that the battle's raging in there at the church, but I just wanted to come home with you. I just crawled in your car in the park parking lot and I find a little refuge with you there and some of us have just invited him right on in not with the same intention of JL we just invited him in because we're like Hezekiah we just want a little peace in our day and so we just want to invite him in and maybe he'll leave us alone can I tell you that even though he gets in your car with you he's still at war with you and he's still going to steal from you he's still going to kill you he's still going to destroy you oh I just want a little peace in my day how about you throw a little blanket over the top of him hand him a little drink of milk and say just go ahead and lay down just for a moment while I gather some resources in my hand and when I gather some resources in my hand buddy you're gonna you're never gonna wake up you don't have to worry about the bed bugs you're gonna have to worry about something else JL is a woman we don't get a lot of detail about and a lot of people in church who seek the spotlight forget that the spotlight is rarely where the victory is won. It wasn't the leader that finished the battle. It was an unlikely woe man. Right? Because had Sisera been awake, he'd have said, whoa. Don't be doing that. And some of us need to realize that even though we don't feel qualified... We feel like we don't have the resources. We are actually the key that God wants to use to put an end to the attack of the enemy in our lives. I mean, here she is. She is a, a Bedouin. She is somebody who is given to hospitality. Actually, her name even means mountain goat. How would you like for your mother to name you that? Everything about her says that she's not going to be the hero of the story. How she was raised, who she was married to, how her mother named her. There's not a thing about her that tells you that her destiny is that she's going to wind up being the woman who nailed the enemy to the floor. And I think many of you feel the same way. There's nothing about my heritage. There's nothing about my life. There's nothing about how I was raised. Nothing about how I was named. Nothing that I possess in the qualities or the anointings of my life that God could use. Can I tell you that God is going to use you. The enemy has you convinced that you don't have the resources. But God will never require something out of you that he first didn't put in you. So J.L. just went on to show this man every possible kindness. Covered him with the rug to hide him and comfort him. And he asked for water. She gave him milk. Some people say just to make him even more sleepy. And then Sisera just drifted off to sleep. Now that her enemy is comfortable, he's asleep in her tent. Jael reaches over there and grabs a little tent peg. She grabs a nail. And then takes that nail and takes the hammer. Now, this is a woman that I would be terrified of. <laughs> this is a woman that I, would, I wouldn't even name her Jael. I would name her Melissa. Like... All right? This is, this, this is that type of a woman. You know, you just go on to sleep. You just go on to sleep. Here, here's some milk. The next time Melissa gives me a rug and some milk, I'm going to stay awake all night long. Like, I'll be over in the guest room, honey. Don't you worry about it. I hear any clinking or clanging. No, 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 there's a tent peg coming out. You just go on to sleep. She just reaches over there, grabs a little tent peg. And the enemy thought that they were at peace. And Jael takes that tent peg and drives it through his head and nails his head to the floor. All the way to the floor. Matter of fact, Judges chapter 4 verse 21, she took a hammer and a tent peg in her hand. She went softly to him, drove the peg into his temple, and it went down into the ground. For he was fast asleep and weary, and he died. I don't think we needed the scripture to tell us that he died, but he died. 
I want to give you just for a moment, as quickly as I can, I'm going to give you five lessons from JL. Number one, always act on the opportunities that God places before you. In other words, seize the moment. Take advantage of what God has placed right before you. JL's actions didn't make sense at the moment. She took a refugee into her tent. She, by her culture, should have given him hospitality and make him feel safe. To kill him was an act of gruesome treachery. We have no idea what actually was going on in the conversation. But what we can know is that J.L. realized that this was an enemy of God's people. And that God placed an opportunity right before her to end the battle. So why allow the battle to go on any longer if the opportunity is right in front of me to deal with it? Why don't I go ahead and deal with it? And so often in our lives, God brings the enemy right into our own place and gives us the opportunity to slay the things that have been trying to destroy us all of our lives. And yet we think we can push that to the end of service or we can push that to the next service or we can push that to the next week or we go wait till Pastor Michael preaches it again or we'll push it down the road but when God brings it before you kill it right then and right there don't wait for another opportunity for the enemy to wake up and realize that you're plotting against him go ahead and kill it right then and right there so when the Holy Spirit prompts you to act act and we usually don't have long to think situations are ever changing Opportunities pass by quickly. Seize the moment. Decide in your heart right here, right now, that when the time comes, you will say yes to God. I will seize the moment. Do not miss your moment. In Matthew chapter 8 and verse 13, Jesus was at a city in Capernaum, and a centurion came and was asking for healing for his servant. Jesus said, I will come and I will heal your servant. The centurion said, Lord, I am not even worthy for you to come into my house. But if you will just send a word, then my servant will be healed. Jesus then uses that and says, I've not even seen this kind of faith even in the people who are supposed to believe in me. I'll send a word. And in that same hour, his servant was healed. He realized that there was a moment that he had with Jesus. He realized that Jesus didn't have to be physically present in order for his servant to be healed. And some of us need to realize that Jesus is present right now to heal. And he has already sent his word. And so don't miss your moment. Go ahead and receive your healing. Matthew chapter 9 and verse 22, there was a woman who had an issue of blood. She sees that Jesus is distracted. She sees because he's distracted and his back is turned to her, she now has a moment. The moment was to violate the law because she had a blood issue. She was supposed to be in her home and not out in the street. She was not supposed to touch anybody. So she sees that Jesus is distracted. His back is turned to her and she says, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, then I will be made whole. So she seizes the moment that Jesus is there and touches the hem of his garment and immediately she is healed. Sees the moment. Capture the moment. In Luke chapter 9, verses 51 through 56, Jesus was getting ready to go through Samaria. He sends his disciples ahead to prepare the journey for him to go to Samaria. He's going to go through Samaria on his way to Jerusalem. This offends the Samaritans that Jesus is headed to Jerusalem. So they refuse Jesus. They refuse to allow Jesus to come to their village. The scripture ends there in the last verse, in verse 56. It says, so Jesus went to another village. So because they were offended, they rejected. Because they didn't like Jesus' travel itinerary. They didn't like how he was doing it. They rejected Christ. Could it be that we don't like the travel agenda of the Holy Spirit and we don't like what he's doing or how he's doing it or we were taught differently or that's of the devil or whatever you've been taught and so you are rejecting the very thing that's going to release you and set you free in your life and you're missing your moment. Meanwhile, the other village received Christ and amazing things happened. Can I tell you at the 9 o'clock? 
if you reject him, he'll just move at the 11 o'clock. If the 11 o'clock rejects him, he'll just try to move at the 1 o'clock. But if we all reject him, he'll just go somewhere else. Take advantage of the opportunities that you have. Let me just say, we never thought there would ever be a threat that we couldn't gather for church. And yet we just, just about 12 months ago, weren't able to meet for church. Take advantage of the opportunities that are before you. I mean, there was, for three months, we didn't, couldn't even have prayer teams up here. And yet, we need to take advantage of the opportunities that are set before us. Seize the moments. When the Holy Spirit begins to move, seize that moment. Because when the waters are troubled, you need to jump into the waters that are troubled at the moment that they're troubled. Seize the opportunity. Second lesson is use what you've been given. Use what you have. You don't lack anything. You may not have what I have, but I also don't have what you have. J.L., under the circumstances, had no better weapon than the tent peg. Since the tent she was staying in was a woman's tent or a female's tent, there was no weapons in the tent. Not only that, she likely had extensive experience putting up tents with tent pegs, so she was skilled with that tool. So instead of going getting a tool that she was unskilled with, she used what she was skilled with in order to defeat the enemy that was in her tent. So use what you have. You may not sing like Melissa, but use what you've got. You may not speak like me, but use what you've got. You may not act like Gigi, but use what you've got. And use what you're skilled at to defeat the enemy where he's at in your life. Use the resources that are given to you. She didn't waste a moment thinking, you know, I would be better off if I had a sword. She didn't call anybody to borrow them. Hey, can you bring over? No. No, no. Hey, pastor, do you have a verse? How about you get skilled so that you don't have to waste time asking me for a word or a sword that you can destroy the enemy in your life. God is equipping his people for the work that he puts in front of them. He gives certain skills and gifts for a reason. And we should always be on the lookout for a reason to use them. To seize the opportunity to use what God has given to us in our life. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 3, or excuse me, chapter 3, verse 5 through 6, I want to read it out of the NLT. It is not that we think we are qualified to do anything on our own. Our qualifications come from God. He has enabled us to be ministers of his new covenant. This is a covenant not of written laws, but of the spirit. The old written covenant ends in death, but under the new covenant, the spirit gives life. The Holy Spirit, it qualifies you and it equips you. That's all you need. Number three. So first one is seize the moment. Take advantage of the opportunity. Number two, use what you've got. Number three, free the oppressed. Free the oppressed. Sisera's murder, or J.L. running that tent peg through him, was a major act of treachery on her part, but yet it was a great act of freedom for everybody else. Could it be that you're going to have to break the rules that you have set up in order to free some other people? And I understand the church is filled with unwritten rules. Can I tell you that you're looking at a guy that really doesn't care what the unwritten rules are. I only care about the rules that are written. And the rules that are written are that we are victorious. We are the head and not the tail. We are above only and never beneath. It is by his stripes that we are healed. We are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. We are overcomers by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. Throw out your unwritten stuff and stick to the written stuff. I don't know if the Holy Spirit can move like that. Who said? Well, my grandpappy said. Well, who's he? Let God be true. And every man a liar. Let God be true. And even though this, she's in this room, she, I think it took a little bit of prodding from God. And we, sometimes I don't know if I can do that. Let's just skip ahead in the Bible from the book of Judges chapter 4 to the life of Jesus, right? Because Jesus is our example. 
Just read the stories of rules that were broken by Jesus. Can I tell you, Jesus was a radical. <laughs> How many of y'all would come to church if I was flipping tables and making whips? There have been some days I've wanted to do it. All right? I mean, God's moving. People are sitting there. Oh, I'm so saved. I don't need Jesus. I'm so saved. I don't need the Spirit. I'm so saved. I don't need to read my Bible. I'm so healed. And I'm, I'm so healed. I don't need any prayer over my life. But yet I'm going to fill out a connect card and say I need prayer over my body. Yet the waters were troubled. The altar teams were called. The elders were forward. And yet we did not come. I want to flip the table and make a whip. Come on. Seize the opportunity and free the oppressed. Matthew 23, Jesus denounced the religious rulers for heaping impossible burdens on the people that were listening to him. In Matthew chapter 8, he touched lepers even though the rules of his day said that doing so would make him unclean. In Mark chapter 3, he healed on the Sabbath even though no work was supposed to be done. So what are you sitting waiting on? Let's go ahead and do the will of God for our lives and free oppressed people. And trust me, I get the messages just like you get them on Facebook. I get all kinds of people telling me that the gifts of the Spirit and the Holy Spirit and all that stuff is wacky and crazy. But I'm going to tell you the only way you're going to win the world is to show that your God is bigger and stronger than their gods. And let the God who answers by fire let him be God trust me I get all that stuff I get people who used to be here in this church and got scared because the Holy Spirit was moving but yet have no problem walking into demon areas and just being comfortable with the demons sitting in their tents I want to be comfortable with the Holy Spirit and not the evil spirits it amazes me how many people leave church because the Holy Spirit began to move and we cast the devil out, we cast demons out. Oh my goodness, i got to go to another church. But you'll go to Walmart and rub devil and rub elbows with the demons. Going to get tight in here, but when it's tight, it's right. Pastor, I don't know if I can come back to your church at the 11 o'clock. They were casting demons out of somebody. Well, isn't that what's supposed to happen at church? Well, I don't know, Pastor. There, you know, there was some rules back in the other church. Well, you ain't at the old church anymore. And if your old church was so great, then go back there. But don't try to change this one. Because in this house, we're going to go with the written rule, which says that demon has to go in the name of Jesus Christ. We have the authority here, not him. We're in control here, not him. This region is ours for Jesus Christ. This region doesn't belong to the devil. No, no, no. We're going to take a nail and we're going to run it through his head and nail him to the floor. You can stay standing. I'm going to give you the last two and we're going to go home. Number four, honor God above all else. Everything has to be done to the glory of God. Everything has to be done to the glory of God. Number five, fight your own battle. Come on, fight the battle. And I understand. I know that you're in a fight. I know I'm in a fight. You know, I, I got up this morning. I've been perfectly healed since I declared it. Perfectly healed since I declared it in this place. And I woke up this morning. You know what I was going to preach? And I walked out this morning to Melissa. And I just pulled down to the waistband of my shorts. And the, the enemy was attacking me in the same area that it started two years ago. So fight your battle. I will not back up and nor should you. We are not of them that draw back. We are not of them that back down. Why do you think the enemy's fighting? Because we have now got the nail in our hand and a hammer in the other hand and we're getting ready to nail him to the floor so he's going to launch every attack he's got to show you, don't battle me, don't fight me. I'm going to wear you out. I'm going to take your family. No, you are not. My whole house will be saved. Because your battle is not against a person. Ephesians chapter 6, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers that are over this present darkness and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. That's where our battle's at. So fight your battle. And I don't care how much you post on Facebook. It's not enough to have that knowledge. You need to do something with it. And let's go to war. Let's battle. The biggest battle you'll ever fight in this life is the battle against sin and apathy in our lives Colossians chapter 2 this is the victory and you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh 
he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. He has taken it away by having nailed it, nailed it to the cross. The victory was prophesied that it would come from a woman. And a woman took a nail and destroyed the enemy. You remember the prophecy? He said, listen, you may have won this little battle here in the garden, but there's going to be a seed born of the woman. And that seed of that woman is going to crush your head. And at the hill called Golgotha, as that wooden hammer, the cross of Calvary was placed into the place of the skull. It went down on the head of the enemy. And as they nailed Jesus Christ to the cross of Calvary, it was nailing our enemy in defeat for the rest of eternity. And the victory is ours forever. He has nailed it to the cross of Calvary. You are victorious. You are the head and not the tail. You are above only and never beneath. And you are blessed forever because of Jesus Christ in your life. Now let's go and establish that victory in this region in Jesus name. We love you. May God bless you. See you next Sunday 9, 11 and 1 in Jesus name. Thank you for being with us today and joining in with our broadcast. I pray that the worship and the message was exactly what you needed to hear and feel. I pray that you felt the presence of the Lord right where you are. If you took the step today to make Jesus the Lord over your life, then let us know by emailing us at siwcenter at gmail.com. We would love to connect and to celebrate with you on this great decision that you've made. And the next step for you then would be to find a digital community group. Also then to go through our Next Steps program here to learn more about SIWC and to become a member here. More information on all of this can be found on our website at siwcenter.org. If throughout the broadcast or throughout your week you have a prayer request or a circumstance or a situation that you would need help in praying about, feel free to visit our website to submit that confidentially. I want to thank you all for your continued generosity and giving as unto the Lord. We do this in accordance to Proverbs chapter 3 and verses 9 and 10. If you would like to give, you can do so online by going to our website. As always, be sure to follow us on all of our social media channels so that we can stay connected. And then let's continue to be a church on purpose.